involving the first in output Y1, <coughs> one involving the first out, second output Y2, and one involving the input U. Okay. Right, what do those derivatives look like? They look like this. Take the derivative of the function, the right hand side with respect to Y1, that's a function. Evaluate that at the steady state. That's what this is. Y, y bar here is a vector because I didn't want to write something so long. Okay. Evaluate that at the steady state, and then you'll get some number here. Multiply that times y1 minus y1 bar, also known as y1 bar. Do the same thing with y2. Do the same thing with u. Okay. It's just more of the same. It's nothing new. Now you got to do it for another equation, though. Right, so you've got two equations, and now you've got to do the same thing for the second equation. Evaluate it at steady state, zero. <coughs> have a derivative with respect to y1, have a derivative with respect to y2, and have a derivative with respect to u. Okay. So you remember the good old days when you had a first order system, you had two derivatives. You had one function, you had to take the derivative with respect to y and u. <coughs> now you have six derivatives, because you have two outputs and two inputs. Sorry, two outputs and one input, but you have two equations. So this, this, this can become unpleasant quickly. Hope you can appreciate this. Right. Like if I gave you five equations and five inputs, you'd have, let me see, each equation would have 10, you have 50 partial derivatives to take. You might not enjoy that. Okay. So I'm going to show you, before too long, you can do all this in, in MATLAB automatically. It can linearize systems for you. Okay. You, can, you can do this in Simulink. You cannot do this in MATLAB itself, as far as I know. And last time when I taught you how to linearize systems in 361, I promised you I'd teach you how to do it in MATLAB. I couldn't teach you now because I had to have simulate, which is something we didn't use in 361. Okay. So, again, these two things will evaluate to zero. Once you take these partial derivatives and evaluate them at the steady state, these will be numbers. Okay. I'm calling that number, not surprisingly, A11. I'm calling this number A12. I'm calling this one coefficient here, b1. And then for the second equation, similarly. Why? Because I already know I'm going to put this in a matrix form, and I want these things to be the elements of the matrix. I know how I like to the elements of the matrix. Right? First element is the row, second element is the column number. So I take all these coefficients for a and put them in a 2 by 2 matrix called a. No big deal. I put the coefficients of b in a, in a column vector with elements b1 and b2 and call that b. And uh, not that probably many people notice this, but it shouldn't be prime. I mean, it shouldn't be bold, because bold is used for vectors, and, and use not a vector in this case. So that's type of number 12. Yes? Is that D1 and D by 1 prime? Yeah, you can't see it, but there, actually, yeah, there are actually, it's just a, I should use a better equation editor than the default one in PowerPoint, but there actually is a prime there. You just, I'm pointing to it for you. So the problem is that when you have subscripts and superscripts, this is superscript can be quite small and weird looking. Okay, but the, it should be y1 prime and y2 prime. It actually is, but it's not very good. So. All right, so you get the gist of this. This is the kind of thing that if someone asks you to do this, you'd say, I know how to do it. It's not hard, but I don't want to. Okay. Like, it's not conceptually challenging. It's just logistically painful to do this. Right? But it's not, it's not anything different than what we've done. So if the system is nonlinear, you have to take this step. You might notice I, I strategically skipped that complication here. I don't want to get into it. All right. So now we're going to do the generic analysis stuff. Right? So we have three cases of second order systems. They can be over damped, they can be critically damped, they can be under damped. The reason that I split these into three different cases is because the responses are different for each case. Okay. So I'm going to do this. This is nothing new. Okay. First of all, I'm going to give you the transfer function. It's either going to be one, it's going to be one of those three cases. Over damped, critically damped, under damped. I'm going to give you the U of S. I'm only going to be interested here in U of S equals step change. Do I do M over S? Okay. So I'll be interested in the response of each of these three systems to a step change of magnitude M. And then I will tell you what the output is for each of these. Okay. It's no different than I've done before. So we're limiting ourselves just to one input type because I don't want to do three different G's with three different inputs. It would be nine different cases. Right? So All right. So 
Um, the first point I'm making here is that if you have, let's say, two first order systems in series like this, so you goes through this transfer function, creates this variable, which subsequently goes through that transfer function to create y. That'd be two first order systems in series. I told you when we first introduced transfer functions that you would multiply transfer functions in series and add them if they're in parallel. Okay. So if you take, if you want the transfer function between y and u, okay, then you just multiply those two transfer functions together. So I've done this in that first equation. And the point I'm making here, in many cases, you'll get a second order, right? If we look at this as second order clearly, and it's over down, right? Because I'm assuming tau 1 and tau 2 are real numbers, and they're not the same. Okay. Um, these type of systems often, but not always, occur because you have two first order systems in the series. Okay. We had a system that looked like that in the example, and that wasn't two first order systems in the series. But it would still look like that. But often they will come from that. All right, so if I wanted to, I could take this expression here, multiply it out to get a polynomial in S, right? And then I know this is the most general form of a second order system. Every second order system can be written in this form with an appropriate value squiggly. Things can only be written in this form if they're over down. So what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying out the denominator to get this, I'm saying, I want to find out what tau and squiggly are in terms of tau 1 and tau 2. It's pretty easy to do, right? Obviously, tau squared equals tau 1 times tau 2, so tau is equal to square root of those two. So I'm just giving you a way to convert between tau 1 and tau 2 and tau and squiggly. Okay. So in other words, if you wanted to know tau and squiggly for your particular problem, and you had tau 1 and tau 2, you choose these two equations. The book gives you the way to go the other way, too. If I give you tau and squiggly, you could calculate tau and tau two. Okay. You're guaranteed for this class of systems that the squiggly is going to be greater than or equal to 1. Otherwise, you can't factor it like that in the first place. Okay. All right. Now, what do I do here? So I want to know the response of the system to a step change. So the way this was done is following. I said, okay, I've got y of s oops, equal g of s. What's g of s? Well, g of s looks like this, for example. Okay, and that's multiplied times u of s, which is, So, I mean, this is not hard. If I give you the g and I give you the u, you multiply the two together to get y, and then now you need to take the inverse Laplace transform of that to get y of t. So this is the kind of entry that's in the, in the table, mercifully. Okay. If you look in the table, they'll have something that looks exactly like, won't have the k and the m, it'll just have a 1 in the uh, numerator, but it'll have s times this term times this term. It's in the table. Okay. And the answer given in the table is, forget the KM, right? If, you, if, you're, if your transfer function that you're trying to take the inverse Laplace transform or differs just by a constant, then you take the take answer out of the table and multiply times that constant. So this is the entry actually in the table. Okay. And then I multiply that times KM. So I haven't done any trickery here. I just use the table. I don't know why this is the answer, even myself. I don't want to take the inverse Laplace transform and find out either. So I let the book do it, and that's what it is. Okay. That is the case if tau 1 and tau 2 are real, but they're not equal to each other. You see, you would have a major problem if they are equal to each other, right? You divide by 0. So you actually get a different answer. If you were to go through the whole process of taking the inverse Laplace transform if tau 1 and tau 2 are equal, you'd find this is the answer. It's different. Okay. Um, and so you see, not surprisingly, these will involve exponential terms, um, kind of like first order systems. And they, again, have terms that look like t over tau. You have two of these because you have two values of tau, which we'll talk more about in the future. And probably at this point, it's easier just to see what these, these things look like. Now, I tried in the past, I don't know if you guys can complain, complain is not the right word, commented that 
Um, if I had animation in my slides, it was very unpleasant for you. I remember someone telling me this. So I tried to take all the animation out of the slides. Because if I give you a PowerPoint with animation, that's not going to work out, right? Um, so this is a whole new slide, I think. And this is what the response of the system looks like. So all I've, is being done here is these two equations are being plotted. Okay? T is being plotted as a function of tau. Okay? So T is scaled. What is tau? Because I don't see tau in that equation. Well, 